The year is 2019 on a Linus Tech Tips discussion thread. User Retro underscore R asked the question, how did RGB lighting as we know it find its way into PCs? That seems pretty straightforward, right? Well, surprisingly, this thread has only 13 comments, and with the insane popularity of RGB lighting, you would think that there's something out there documenting its history, but there isn't. One commenter even stated that no one has really cared enough to try putting it all together. Well, I care enough. RGB. Whether you like it or not, it seems to have found its way into a majority of PC components. From graphics cards, to RAM, to whatever this is. There's just something about taking a slice of that rainbow and putting it on our devices that we just can't get enough of. RGB lighting is so commonplace these days that we don't ever really pause and ask how did all of this happen? Who or what made this possible? To answer these questions, we're gonna go back in time and take a look at the people and the inventions that got us to where we are today. This seemingly innocuous technology has a colored history featuring accidental inventions, one of the most influential physicists in history, and believe it or not, frog legs. But first, what even is RGB? Not to be confused with RGB lighting, the RGB color model uses red, green, and blue light in different combinations to create a broad spectrum of colors. If all of the colors are shown at the lowest intensity, then black is produced, while the highest intensity creates white. Each primary color has an intensity range from 0 to 255, so that's 256 different shades of each color. And by adding these shades together, we can create 16.8 million different colors. This process is also known as additive color and its development can be attributed to someone that you might not expect. Take a second to think about the great inventors throughout history, the people that changed the course of the world. Who comes to mind? You probably thought of people like Leonardo da Vinci, Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein, and Nicolas Cage. While none of these are wrong answers, I'm willing to bet there's one guy that probably didn't make your list and that's James Clerk Maxwell. Maxwell was a mathematical physicist from Scotland and a majority of modern physics can be attributed to his work. Just to give you an idea of how big of a deal this guy is when it comes to modern physics, Albert Einstein once said that I stand not on the shoulders of Newton, but on the shoulders of James Clerk Maxwell. I don't know how to put this, but I'm kind of a big deal. Really? But obviously, RGB is way cooler. So how does Maxwell fit in here? Well, in 1855, he theorized that every shade of the rainbow could be created through different combinations of red, green, and blue light. So to test his theory, Maxwell teamed up with photographer Thomas Sutton, who took three black and white photographs each with a red, green, and blue filter, and then overlaid them to get the final product. You're looking at the first color photograph. While it may not seem impressive at first, Maxwell is basically the father of RGB. All right, so additive color is cool and all, but how did we take these principles and jazz up our computers with it? Aha, uh -huh. we can't talk about RGB lighting without bringing up one of the most, if not the most revolutionary inventions of all time, the light bulb. Now, most of you were probably taught at some point that Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, and you've probably also heard that Edison stole the idea and took all the credit. But what really happened? Did Thomas Edison invent the light bulb? Kind of. Okay, so in all seriousness, that isn't a totally wrong answer. It's just that innovation rarely happens in a vacuum, and the light bulb is no exception. So if we want to learn more about the history of the light bulb, then we have to talk about Alessandro Volta, who predates Thomas Edison by 50 years. And if that name sounds familiar, it's because the electrical measurement Volt is named after him. That's pretty neat. Alessandro Volta was an Italian physicist with a keen interest in electricity. And in 1791, his friend Luigi Galvani made an announcement. I have an announcement. By contacting two different metals with the leg muscles of a skinned frog, an electrical current was generated, which in turn caused the legs to twitch. So with these findings, he called it animal electricity, and he surmised that a new form of electricity could be found in living tissue. Volta, on the other hand, disagreed. I disagree. He theorized that the frog legs were just a conductor for the current that flowed between the two metals. And so to test his theory, he started experimenting with only metals and found that animal tissue wasn't needed to produce a current. Volta settled the debate once and for all in 1800 when he announced his invention of the electric battery, also known as the voltaic pile. The voltaic pile was the first source of a continuous electrical current, and that leads us to Humphrey Davy. Humphrey Davy was a self-taught physicist from the UK who was inspired by the voltaic pile. He connected wires and a piece of carbon to his own battery in 1802, which produced electric light. However, there were a few problems. The light didn't last very long, it was hard to control, and it was way too bright for practical use. And this would be a common theme in the development of the light bulb for nearly 70 years. By 1870, inventors were racing to crack the code that would lead to a practical, cost-efficient light bulb. And two such inventors were Canadians Henry Woodward and Matthew Evans. In 1874, they filed a patent for an electric lamp with the hopes of commercial success, but they couldn't get any investors on board. So eventually, in 1879, they ended up selling their patent to someone who was able to rigorously test and fully realize the idea, Thomas Edison. To say Thomas Edison was hard at work developing the light bulb would be an understatement. 
His team tested over 3,000 designs and 6,000 plant materials before they discovered that a carbonized bamboo filament would last over 1,200 hours. It's also worth noting that Joseph Swan, another inventor from Britain, independently developed a light bulb with commercial implications in 1879. And that's the same year that Edison filed his patent. So it didn't take long before these dudes had a bit of a rivalry going on and they were finding flaws in each other's designs and improving on them. Edison even took Swan to court on grounds of patent infringement, but it turned out that he didn't have a very strong case. So eventually they joined forces and started the Edison and Swan Electric Light Company, which then dominated the English market. Even with all of this in mind, it's no secret that Thomas Edison is the person most commonly associated with the invention of the light bulb. But why? The answer lies in the practicality of his design. It was just simply better than others. Yes, there were other inventors that were successful in creating electric lights before him, but Edison's design was inexpensive and practical, which led to it becoming the standard worldwide. Over the course of the next few decades, the incandescent light bulb became part of everyday life. It found its way into cars, street lamps, storefronts, photography, businesses, and homes. Regardless of who invented what, I hope you're seeing the wealth of knowledge and scientific discovery that's wrapped up into a single device. It's pretty mind-blowing that a debate about frog legs eventually played a role in making RGB lighting as we know it possible with LEDs. LEDs can trace their roots back to 1907 due to an observation by English scientist Henry Round. While he was working on radio equipment, he identified a phenomenon that would lay the groundwork for LEDs, and it's called electroluminescence. This essentially makes electrical energy convert into visible light without generating heat. And this is also why your RGB keyboard doesn't melt right in front of you. Yet surprisingly, this discovery never really took off, and not much research was done into electroluminescence until 1924, thanks to a Russian scientist. Everyone say hi to Oleg Vladimirovich Losev. While studying the diodes and radio receivers, he noticed the same phenomenon that Henry Round had noticed 16 years earlier. Losev became the first person to seriously study the effect and proposed a theory on how it worked and envisioned practical applications. He even theorized correctly that the reason for the light emission had something to do with this super cool new science called, oh, I don't know, quantum mechanics. He even wrote to Einstein to confirm his hunch, but he never heard back. Unfortunately, it's believed that Losev died due to starvation when the Germans laid siege to Leningrad in 1942 and his work was nearly forgotten. Now this brings us to 1961, where LEDs as we know them really started to take shape. While working on a laser diode for Texas Instruments, Robert Beard and Gary Pittman accidentally invented an infrared LED. And unfortunately, this didn't have any practical use at the time because the light it emitted was invisible to humans. This is where general electric scientist Nick Holonyak Jr. stepped in. In 1962, he created an LED that emitted light on the visible spectrum. He recognized the potential immediately, going so far as to inscribe the magic one on the back of the original device. This achievement earned him the title, Father of the LED. Over the next few decades, we saw the advancements in the brightness and colors of LEDs, including yellow, green, and orange. Then in 1994, Shuji Nakamura made the first high brightness blue LED. This really sets things in motion because with the addition of blue light, the full spectrum of additive color was now represented in commercially available LEDs. Because they're the most efficient form of light, LEDs are used just about everywhere today from street lights and refrigerators to TVs and phones, or what we're gonna talk about next, computers and peripherals. LEDs had humble beginnings. During the early days of computing, IBM incorporated LEDs for the first time on circuit boards in 1964, where they functioned as indicators. Between the 1970s and the 1990s, PCs and their peripherals really didn't evolve much in terms of lighting the way we think of it today. Manufacturers were more focused on increasing memory or processing speeds as the market advanced. And it wasn't until the late 90s and early 2000s that we would start to see the rise of gaming products and illumination on peripherals. In 1999, Razer launched the first ever gaming mouse called the Boom Slam. And this was also the same year that a patent was filed titled Computer Keyboard Light System, which states that with the increasing use of computers, more number of PCs are found outside the office, such as in dormitories and bathrooms, where light is found to be a problem. It is necessary to keep a lighting system for convenience and using the keyboard. The solution this patent provided might seem funny. It was to have a literal lamp mounted to the computer that essentially points at the keyboard. And this wasn't the only patent trying to solve the ever-growing problem of keyboard illumination. There were at least five other patents between 1999 and 2003. So it was clear that lighting on keyboards had practical purposes. This was something that people actually needed. Then in 2004, SteelSeries launched the first ever gaming headset called the Siberia as well as the first gaming mechanical keyboard, the SteelKeys 6G. What I found funny was that other brands later claimed that they're the first gaming mechanical keyboard, like Gigabyte in 2008, and then again with the Razer Black Widow in 2010, but they technically weren't. Now I think the crown for the first true gaming keyboard should go to Logitech, with their G15 keyboard that launched in 2005. It included basic backlighting, a screen that showed your in-game statistics, and macro keys. It was a keyboard that was really ahead of its time, and if you owned one, all of your friends knew. In 2007, Rockat released the first ever addressable RGB mouse called the Kone. 
but no one had ever made a mechanical keyboard with addressable RGB. That was still seven years away, and nothing revolutionary was released in terms of RGB products during those seven years. Fast forward to CES in January of 2014, when Corsair unveils the K70 mechanical RGB gaming keyboard. At this point, it became like an RGB space race. Logitech, Corsair, and Razer were all working on an RGB keyboard. And while Corsair was the first RGB keyboard ever showcased, it was not the first to hit the market. Corsair ran into difficulties that delayed their launch, so when the Razer Black Widow Ultimate Chroma became available in August of 2014, it was officially the first RGB keyboard on the market. Then Corsair and Logitech would launch theirs soon after. Now all of this happened really fast, but one thing is clear, that 2014 was a key year for RGB. The addition of the entire color spectrum on a keyboard was game changing. A comment on the announcement video for the Razer Black Widow Chroma perfectly sums it up. Does anyone ever go back and rewatch this to remember a time where RGB lighting didn't exist? Then this video came out and literally changed the face of gaming peripherals forever. From here, every brand and their dogs started implementing RGB capabilities into whatever products they could. The X99A Godlike was the first RGB motherboard ever released by MSI in July of 2015. Then we saw RGB mousepads, which Razer did first in May of 2015, when they released the Firefly mousepad. Wired mousepad, wireless mouse, what a future. After that, Gale released the first RGB RAM in October of 2016, which interestingly enough, it wasn't super popular. It was only when major brands did it that it really took off, and today you can see it in almost every PC build, along with RGB CPU coolers. Speaking of which, the first one was launched by Lepa in January of 2017, which again, wasn't super popular until other major brands adopted the concept. With all of these rapid RGB product releases, people started to wonder what was going on, which led to Reddit posts like this one titled, all of these RGB components and peripherals are getting ridiculous. What started off as a need back in 1999 became something people wanted just for fun. And this is the key concept that helps explain why RGB lighting is so popular. To better understand this, we need to take a look into pre-RGB case modding in the 2000s, before LED strips even entered the market. If you wanted to illuminate your PC, you would need to install cold cathode lights. And it didn't just stop at lighting either. There were entire books dedicated to PC customization that showed you literally how to cut and paint your parts and put it all back together. Also, as a side note, I just want to point out how someone bought this book in 2017 and then gave it a one-star review because it's old news. Like, dude, what did you expect? Anyway, check out these clips from a video of the German case modding championship in 2009. You can see how just about all of the lighting, whether it's cathode or LED, is limited to one of three colors at a time. The case modding section. Joy contestants war. When we got to this part of our research, resources were somewhat limited. All of the information that used to be on online forums just wasn't there anymore. Now, luckily for us, we have a moderator that used to be involved in this scene. So let's hear what they have to say. The whole idea was you wanted to have it uh, um, pretty much to be unique and like your style or some people went the uh, road of uh, also making plexiglass about the hard drives and so on, putting in LEDs because you were stuck with pretty much the color you choose. So the same was with the uh, cathodes when they came out. There was a lot of time spent to customize those cases. So that's how the whole thing with uh, uh, case modding started. Did you catch that? One of the main things driving PC case modding was this desire for customization. It's pretty clear that PC builders during this period really cared about making something unique, but they were also limited in terms of color options for their lighting. This all changed in late 2013 when WS2811 LED strips were released, and it set the stage for the new standard of lighting up the inside of your PC. Shortly after, the WS2812 strips followed, and with these on the market, cold cathode lighting became a thing of the past. Okay, so I know we just went through a lot of information, but what I hope you take away is the decades and decades of trial and error that got us here. You can see this pattern of discovery and people then asking, what can I create with this knowledge? How can I make it better? How can I make it practical? Or as we eventually saw, how can I make it beautiful? And that's sort of where we are today. The ability to customize and personalize is at the core of this obsession with RGB. We can create any theme or aesthetic that we want, and then we can get our lighting to match. We love showing off our creativity or technical prowess. Think about it. A car enthusiast will spend considerable time and money modifying and customizing their car, paying close attention to every little detail. Or a vinyl collector will shell out the extra bucks to get that awesome limited vinyl variant for their favorite artist. If something exists, then chances are there is a whole community of people dedicated to it. And PC enthusiasts are no different. I mean, the Battlestation subreddit alone has nearly 4 million subscribers at the time of this video. 
Today we have RGB in almost everything. We have RGB water blocks, RGB fans, RGB GPU braces, RGB headset stands. We literally have RGB power supply cables, small light up triangles that you shove into your PC and sticks that sit on your desk and they do absolutely nothing except for light up. Six stars sold, 10 computers, sound pads, speakers, antenna, satellites. Now this is where our story starts. All of these different RGB parts and peripherals from different brands created a problem. If you wanted to keep your lighting synced up, you'd have to buy everything from one single brand in order to use one application to sync everything together. You were sort of forced to lock into an ecosystem of products, or else you'd have to install one software for each brand, and then you'd have to configure your lighting to match in each application. So we created Signal RGB in 2020, and we're the first full-time development team to focus on solving the problem of synced RGB lighting across brands. Signal RGB gives everyone the freedom to mix and match products as they see fit, and we're gonna continue our mission to support as many devices as we can. You know, I think there could be something bigger at play here when it comes to this obsession with RGB. As humans, we long for a sense of community, a sense of belonging. We feel safe in a group of like-minded individuals where we can showcase our creativity and inspiration or receive feedback on how we can improve. In fact, it's proven that we thrive in environments like this. There's so much going on in the world that it often feels like our individual voices get drowned out and we seem to go unnoticed and question where our place in the universe is. When we band together, our passions and interests become an extension of who we are, a way to make our mark and belong to something bigger than ourselves. So the next time you see an elaborately themed PC setup, think about the bigger picture. Don't look at it as just a bunch of cables and components on a desk, but see it as a window of opportunity into understanding the person behind the setup. Or maybe we just like shiny stuff. This video was made possible by us. Seriously, if you're a fan of RGB, then you should check out Signal RGB. You'll be able to control and sync your RGB with one free app. And if you like this video, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. It took a lot of research, time, and effort, but we honestly believe that it was a topic worth covering. We hope you learned something, and we'll see you next time.